Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, lawmakers wrestle with COVID-19's impact on Minnesota's people and economy, plus possible new funding for COVID-19 tests and a potential moratorium on payments for struggling renters and homeowners. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. During a floor debate last week over allowing beer and wine with restaurant takeout, another debate emerged, one that grapples Welcome with economic easy, recovery and public health. We're not ready to open stadiums, but we are ready to allow people to buy a little beer uh, when they go over for their takeout. We are ready for people to uh, play golf on unattended golf courses. We're ready for car washes to open that are automated. And we're ready for businesses that are at least as good as Walmart to be available to go buy shoes at. I think it is preposterous, Mr. President, and to the whole rest of the state who's watching, that we allow these giant stores to be open, and they, and they could well be, that are making incremental moves to more and more sanitation. But I would not bring somebody that was elderly I loved into one of those places, because I believe they are dangerous. At the same time, we say, oh no, these one-person shops in Anoka and Stillwater and Lakeville cannot be open because they present a danger to somebody. I come from a family business, a bar business, that have been in business for 90 years, fourth generation, and what it is doing to our bar and restaurant industry in the state of Minnesota is devastating. This is only one small step that will help. And there are several other businesses, mom and pop businesses across this state that are hurting just as bad. Uh, the hair salons and, and going on and on and on, these businesses. We can open these businesses safely. We know social distancing. We can do this. Minnesota needs to reopen these businesses. I will guarantee you there will be 30 percent of these businesses that will never open again. And it is very sad for a 90-year-old business that probably will never open up again. We need to open Minnesota. I rise mostly to speak to the comments that have been made by Senator Zabler and Jasinski and that I've heard from home watching the proceedings over the last couple of weeks. I haven't been coming into sessions, Mr. President, and that is because on my shifts I regularly enter the rooms and care for patients directly who are actively ill with COVID-19 coughing and septic and febrile. I didn't think it was a good idea for me to come in and expose other members and their families to my level of risk. Furthermore, I think the entire fact that we can con congregate here violates the spirit and the letter of Executive Order 2035 advising us to stay in place. Nevertheless, I come in because I think it's important that you know, that my colleagues know the experience of healthcare workers where I work, and you can factor that into the decisions you make going forward. I would just counsel us all to summon the virtues of caution and skepticism and a bit of military planning as we move forward. You know, this all started with the president saying, that everyone who wants a test can get a test. And I don't bring that up to be a smart aleck or to score points, but it rankles still because I still see patients in the emergency department regularly who come in and are afraid and are febrile and have had a cough and have body aches and they don't get a test because they don't have enough. And they go home with advice to take care of themselves and sequester themselves, drink lots of fluids. If they have trouble breathing, give us a call back. They're afraid for their families, they're afraid for their children, and that is the very best medicine we can offer them. We don't have PPEs to give them, personal protective equipment, we don't have a vaccine or an advised medicine. Members, that's how medicine is practiced in the most primitive and impoverished nations in the world, and that is now how medicine is practiced in the heart of downtown Minneapolis, a stone's throw from the University of Minnesota. There is such a false dichotomy out here about this discussion as if some people just want to lock everything down and keep it locked down and we don't want to open up any more businesses. We are here in this moment because we are trying to expand opportunities for our businesses and many of us wish we could go further. I just got off the phone checking with Minnesota Hospital Association, 
multiple administrators around the state. We have in this state a thousand ICU beds. Currently, 100 of them are being used. We have capacity. We have almost 1,500 ventilators in Minnesota. Currently, we're using about 100 of them. We are starting to learn that the use of ventilators, which we were thinking was a good thing four weeks ago, needs to be reconsidered because just jacking up the pressure inside the lungs doesn't necessarily get people better. The fact of the matter is we've doubled the death rate on ventilator use over the last four weeks than what we used to do. We used to expect one out of three people that got on a vent would be dead and not be able to get off. Now we expect two out of three to be dead and not be able to get off. So if for one minute we don't think that at the end of this, and there is going to be an end to this, we're going to have ventilators unpacked sitting on the pallet. We have the capacity to handle right now, this state, what's going to come down the pike. Using the Minnesota model, if we stay with what we're doing, a stay at home for everybody, we will peak in July, requiring approximately 3,000 beds at our peak and having somewhere around 20,000 deaths, I believe. I could have some of those numbers wrong. But what's important is that if we pivot and we say we are going to continue to protect and have a stay-at-home recommendation for self-quarantining for that vulnerable group of people that are over the age of 70 with multiple comorbidities, not much changes. The number of deaths stays approximately the same. The number of hospital beds required at the surge stays the same. We push the peak back one month. Senator Andrew Matthews has proposed legislation to begin the process of opening Minnesota businesses. You had a bill before the Jobs and Economic Growth Committee this week to open up Minnesota businesses. How would this bill work? Yeah, thank you, Shannon. Uh, my bill is an attempt to come up with a plan. Uh, business owners are really struggling right now. Uh, they want to be able to open, and many business owners know they can operate safely because of the type of business they're in, yet they're arbitrarily closed at the moment. So we're trying to get to a plan where they can be open. My bill uh, laid out one proposal uh, because the governor and Deed have been looking at some industries and going through them on getting some things back reopened. Um, that would probably take a lot of time, so I was trying to flip it and see can we have business owners come forward and say, here's our plans that we already have where we know how we can do this safely and use that as a starting point for making decisions on how things will be reopened. So as to try to set up a framework uh, to allow business owners to give input quicker on what their safety plans would look like for their customers or their, uh, their employees as well. So the businesses would develop a plan about how they can reopen safely. They would submit it to the Department of, um, to DEED, Department of Employment and Economic Development. Um, and then DEED would have three days to turn that around. Is, is that a reasonable amount of time for DEED to be able to evaluate individual businesses? Well, I know that uh, it was likely going to be one of the first things DEED would bring back. Uh, and it was. It was thrown out there because this is uh, a matter of urgency for many businesses. They're now measuring in days and not in weeks. And some have even told me they probably won't be able to make it till May. Uh, but I would like to have this conversation about how we can do it quickly. There's other ways. Maybe we can do this by large industry segments rather than each individual businesses. I think there are some ideas that we could try to flesh out in there. I think Deed is trying to come up with some strategies too. The commissioner announced at the meeting that they had released this template on what kind of a widespread business reopening plan might look like. I was able to look through it. Um, and I think we could even get to a point that would even be better than this bill. Maybe it could be, here's a checklist of things. If you commit to getting these things done on this checklist, then just reopen. I think that would be a wonderful thing because uh, I do agree with, you know, we don't want to have government uh, oversight and micromanaging on everything. But we are trying to strike a balance between the governor's need for oversight and safe reopening of the economy and business owners need 
for a, a speedy process since this is getting urgent. Now, because it is a peacetime emergency, my understanding is though that the, the ability to reopen business does have to come from Governor Walls and his administration. Is that accurate? Yes, I believe that's correct. Uh, I haven't dug into all of the peacetime emergency details nearly in depth as, as I'm sure Governor Walls and, and others have, uh, but that is correct. I do think they've gone hand in hand. I know Deed and the governor have worked really closely together. Uh, we've been communicating, uh, other legislators have been uh, communicating with Deed regularly. Our leaders have been talking with Governor Walls. Uh, this is all a collaborative effort. Uh, and I think that we all are going to find a good way to move forward here soon. Now, just moments ago, you said this is an urgent thing, down to days, weeks for some of these businesses. But on the flip side, even when they do reopen, it won't be business as usual with social distancing and all of that. So what is your message to the bar owners, to the restaurant owners, to people who own salons in this uncertain time that we're facing? Well, my message to them would be, if you haven't already, you should start coming up with a plan of what a new normal will look like and how you would plan to try to safely operate. And I know that many business owners have already been doing this, and that was one of the reasons why I stepped forward with this bill, because Governor Walls has started laying out in some of his off-the-cuff comments at his press conferences about what he'd like to see uh, from businesses to get reopened. Uh, a lot of business owners have already done it and matched up point by point with what the governor is wanting. So my message would be if, if folks haven't been working on that, uh, it would be a good time to do it and probably to write it down as well. Get it ready, be prepared, and then um, we're going to do the best we can. We need to ask all of our citizens in our communities to do what they can to reach out, to help small businesses, to order from that restaurant or to go shop at a local store uh, versus a big box, uh, box chain retail store. Um, we'll all have a part to play in this and pulling this together. And this is likely going to be quite a bit different circumstance for a long time. Senator Andrew Matthews, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. I also spoke with Senator Matt Klein for his perspective. You are a hospital physician and you are treating patients with COVID-19 and you are also a member of the legislature. What do you want Minnesotans to know? You know, the biggest thing, Shannon, is you hear a lot of us physicians complaining about how we don't have testing. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Not only that we can reassure our patients and give them a diagnosis one way or the other, whether they have COVID-19, but also as we try to work to get Minnesota back to work, having testing and knowing where our cases are uh, is, gonna, is gonna be essential to part of that strategy. So if we know exactly where there's an outburst of cases uh, and where it's spreading and we can get in touch with those people and their contacts, we can be much more strategic about shutdowns. Right now, because we don't have testing, we have these blanket shutdowns, which are having you know, the devastating impacts that you're aware of. So I do want people to know that, that as Governor Walls works, and I think he's doing a great job, to expand testing in Minnesota, that's, that's gonna open up a lot of doors for us, both as health professionals and as legislators. Now, I read just in the paper this morning, though, that there is an unknown number of people who are asymptomatic but are carrying uh, COVID-19. Does, how does that factor in? It's true, and that's why we're telling people at this time to sort of wear masks to the supermarket and obviously practice social distancing. Minnesotans have been extraordinarily adept at that, and that's great. Uh, but again, uh, even if we have sort of universal testing, that we can exp we can uh, figure out where sort of hot spots are, and we can even be more tactical about those types of behaviors. So uh, you're right; it's it's a problem that there are asymptomatic carriers walking around. Somebody who looks perfectly healthy may actually be carrying the disease. Uh, so that's why this has been a particular challenge. Now, as you know, Governor Wall's shelter-in-place order was meant to flatten the curve, to slow the rate of infection, and also to buy time. One of the consequences of that has been record unemployment and a slowing of the economy. So as a lawmaker, how do you weigh that tension between the economy and public health? Well, this is what has been inspiring, is that I, this is, uh, except with some exceptions, this has not been a partisan issue. I think Minnesotans from both parties realize that while the virus is a tremendous threat to our public health, economic devastation is also a threat to the health of Minnesota. And we need to find a pathway to 
to reconcile those two things and do the right thing. And, and Governor Walls, you know, today is going to put out a plan for how to get Minnesota back to work. I think he's thinking about that very strategically. Sort of the universal stay-at-home blanket shutdown order that he had originally was necessary to slow the progress down of this disease and to give us some time to build up our capacity at the hospital. Uh, now, as we move the economy back to starting, we're going to have to implement safe practices uh, and find certain industries uh, that are more uh, ready than others. Uh, but we do have to get Minnesota back to work because we can't ruin our economy here in this state. Senator Klein, I, I want to thank you for your service to the health of Minnesotans, and I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you for your good work in this difficult time. Health experts say the ability to broadly test for COVID-19 is key to lifting economic restrictions. Senator Carla Nelson has authored a bill to provide funding for test development. You have introduced a bill that would provide grant money for COVID-19 research into tests to detect the COVID-19 virus. Who will receive these grants? Sure. Uh, well, let me first say it's a little broader than just detecting the virus. It also includes testing for that all important serologic uh, antibody testing. Uh, so both the um, diagnostic testing, molecular diagnostic testing, and the antibody testing, those are the things that are needed to get people back to work quickly and safely. And uh, the bill is written such that uh, it would be a grant process and uh, those who are eligible would need to be able to uh, do both of uh, the research, the implementation of the tests that I described that are really going to help get people back to work and also do so uh, in a way that they have all of the um, experts on hand uh, to do that well and that they be a national center for this type of testing. It is so essential that we make sure that the testing is um, not only efficiently done, but effective as well. Now the Mayo Clinic comes to mind, so does the University of Minnesota, but I assume there are other uh, groups that could get this funding? Well, I don't know what, I don't, I can't speak to other groups being eligible. Uh, certainly the bill that I have uh, put forth uh, has these very specific things uh, for eligibility, which gets to the quality that I spoke of and also the ability to implement quickly. So as I looked at the bill, uh, there was a fairly long list of the types of tests to be developed. So there's rapid response, there's quantitative droplets, there's the serologic test that you mentioned. Um, and I could go on. Is the intent to sort of spark innovation and providing um, lots of options in terms of getting that testing out that, that we need? Well, uh, to the first part, uh, innovation is always good. Uh, but my goal is to basically get out the best research that we have, get it out quickly, make sure it's effective, efficient, and we get the results that we need so that Minnesotans can get back to work uh, quickly and safely. And it's going to require this high level of testing. Both Mayo and the U can do 10,000 tests a day. Um, this is essential uh, because this virus is going to be with us for a while. We, but we have to be able to live with the world that we are in now, the COVID-19 world, and it's going to require this kind of testing. And anyone that is eligible, certainly we want them to be able to do that rapid, effective, efficient testing. No doubt that all sorts of research entities are trying to come up with a reliable, quick test. Is state funding, is this kind of incentive necessary? And, and if so, presumably it is, is $20 million enough? Oh, it's a good question. Uh, certainly the funding is necessary, both for the startup costs, for getting the reagents, uh, the ingredients that are gonna make, that make this possible. Um, but I don't know if 20 million is enough. I can tell you the 20 million that I'm asking for uh, is enough. Uh, Mayo is asking for 20 million, as is the University of Minnesota asking for 20 million as well. Um, now, uh, Senator Benson has a grant that I think looks more like particularly 
perhaps what the U is looking at, although I, I couldn't speak to that for sure. But what I would say is, you know, the feds have already sent $1.1 billion to Minnesota. It's sitting in MMB right now. There's another $1.1 billion coming. Uh, the state legislature has already appropriated a $200 million to the governor for his COVID-19 response uh, and other $300 million to our hospitals and such. So I would say that the money is there. Uh, we just need to get it out the door so it can be put to effective use here. And to find that test that can help everybody go back to hopefully a more normal Yes. Yes. And, and that, I mean, the antibody test is, is, is proven to, to, to work. And it's also then being used uh, for that serologic, for that convalescent therapy, that treatment therapy. So people who have antibodies uh, in their plasma then um, are, that is able to help those who are recover more quickly from COVID-19. So uh, I think we, we do have the tools. We just need to be able to um, execute them on a large scale. Senator Nelson, I want to thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you, Shannon. As unemployment numbers reach record highs, many Minnesotans are now struggling to pay their rent or mortgages. Negotiations have been underway to bring relief to those impacted by COVID-19. Senator Tory Westrom recently spoke at a virtual press conference. Senator Weber, who is having def def technical difficulties joining us, but him and myself have uh, worked with the House and the governor's office. Uh, we have a package and a bill introduced today that rep represents the agreement we had with uh, Alice Hausman and the House of Representatives and uh, the governor's office and uh, the housing commissioner, we want to urge them to act swiftly on this and reconsider their support. Uh, at the present time, this package would be $30 million of emergency aid for those affected by COVID-19, either through the illness or loss of a job or income because of this epidemic. And it would also give certainty to the property owners and tenants of a 60-day eviction moratorium, as well as a 30-day extension if the governor uh, so chooses at the end of the 30 days, or the end of the 60 days, giving a 90-day eviction moratorium. This largely reflects the offer that the House gave back to the Senate with two small changes. We made those changes. Representative Hausman and I had agreement on it, and it's time for the governor to act on this so we can get this important package and assistance for homeowners, tenants, utility companies, and those that are in a situation of arrears or having rent unpaid or utilities unpaid. But this package would even reach to those with mortgage concerns and trouble uh, contract for deeds. It would be a big help to those that have lost income because of COVID-19 emergencies, as well as or if they've come down with the illness. Assistant Minority Leader Jeff Hayden is calling for a moratorium on rent and mortgage payments. I spoke with him this week. So on March 23rd, Governor Walls signed an executive order suspending evictions, lease termination, and foreclosures for the length of the peacetime emergency. You released a statement saying Minnesotans also need a rent and a mortgage moratorium. What's the distinction? What are you after? Well, what I want to make sure is that at the end of the peacetime emergency, that people don't end up with three, four, five months worth of rent that they're unable to pay. Uh, and then they end up going, having to go to court and get eviction notices or get foreclosed upon. So I think that the moratorium is fine. But what we also need to be able to do is to allow those mortgages or rent to be forgiven. Um, and we have a mechanism that the state and we're also lobbying the federal government to help uh, to pay for that. But we don't want this to turn into a situation that people can't pay for their rent now because they got enough money miraculously come up with a bunch of money after three months. And if they don't have that lump sum, that they would either be evicted or mortgage uh, uh, or foreclosure proceedings would start on them. So last week, Republican Senators Westrom and Weber said that they have an agreement with the House DFL for 
emergency housing support, and it would be about $30 million um, in assistance for those impacted financially by COVID-19. Are you in favor of this package? Well, I think it has to be a lot more money. Um, I'm not sure if that deal is set in stone yet. Um, and talking uh, in, in our leadership here and the Democratic and the DFL uh, Minnesota Senate, as well as uh, speaking with the speaker and the governor, I know that they're pushing for something a lot more closer to $100 million. And that number is a little fluid based on how long <clears throat> we'll be in the peacetime emergency. Uh, but we think we need a lot more money to be able uh, to, to deliver a rental assistance package that actually works for Minnesotans. So what's your understanding of how this works? There's a yet to be determined amount of money that's available for grants to bring people up to date who related to COVID-19 have not been paying their rent or their mortgages. Is that kind of the idea? Yeah, and it's a rental assistance program. I mean, we have uh, tons of people that have been laid off, furloughed, hours have been reduced, um, uh, not been able to work, and thus uh, the unemployment, you know, doesn't come in at their full salary, and they haven't been able to keep up with their day-to-day, -day, you know, uh, circumstance. And so since they have a reduced uh, amount of money that's coming in and really no, no other opportunity to make money, we want people to be able to apply to show uh, that this is what happened to them. This was their situation. This is uh, why they got on unemployment. There's ways to validate, verify um, who, who who needs the money and then be able to really help people. You know, the eight, the, the my, my district on the A side has about 80% rental. So we have a lot of people and they're in the service industry and others that have been laid off. And I really want to make sure that those folks don't get evicted when we are uh, in the peacetime emergency. Now, is there a mechanism to prevent any kind of fraud from people just who simply just aren't paying their rent because they think they get a break from from paying rent during this time? You know, I, I think so. You know, first of all, I believe in Minnesotans and I believe that they're honest. I know that there's always a few bad actors out there. But for the most part, we have those kind of regulations, those verifications um, that can show that people, no matter if it's the UI system or other ways in which they can show uh, that they've been affected by this pandemic and this pandemic. And even if they're a caregiver who has to try to figure out how to stay home to, to take care of someone who might have the disease, there's a lot of secondary effects of this. So I think that we have a system that, is, that won't be overly bureaucratic, that will be open, and that will be able to help assist uh, Minnesota with, uh, with, with not only the idea of a rent moratorium, but on foreclosure moratorium, but also have some rental or mortgage assistance so that so that they can get back on their feet and not uh, uh, become homeless. If, if we don't do things like this, we're going to have hundreds of thousands of people that potentially could be ho homeless, and that would be inhumane, and our system wouldn't be able to take care of them. Senator Jeff Hayden, I want to thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.